Hello. Welcome to another in our series of digital slide review and sign out sessions. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel coming to you from the uh, cold climes of the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And our program is part of the uh, Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, a joint venture with PATH Presenter and the Digital Pathology Association. So our program today uh, will center around a relatively common uh, question that arises um, and may or may not be really uh, critical in terms of diagnosis, but is certainly helpful to understanding uh, a little bit better of a fairly common problem, uh, and that is the problem of uh, an adnexal cystic lesion. Uh, so our case, uh, incident case, is a 33-year-old woman who's noted to have a uh, persistent uh, cystic lesion adjacent to uh, the uterus, the adnexal location. And uh, this nicely raises the differential of considerations for these type of paratubal or adnexal cysts uh, in the setting where they're, we're not thinking about uh, cystic ovarian ne neoplasms. Um, and so paratubal cysts are very common benign findings. Sometimes they can be large enough to be clinically resected. Uh, other times they're more of an incidental uh, little ditzel sort of finding. Um, I think there are a couple of ways to think about these, but I'd like to think of them in terms of kind of their embryologic or histologic origins. Uh, so we have a number of cysts that occur in this location that would be classified as having a Mullerian uh, uh, origin arising from the, uh, uh, you know, mesenchyme or the, the epithelial nature of uh, tissues that uh, lead to the development of the Mullerian uh, or female gynecologic uh, system. We also have a, a, a sort of an incidental finding, the so-called uh, Walthard uh, rests of, of cells that uh, are generally considered to be somewhat transitional. And sometimes these become large enough to be uh, uh, clinically recognized, usually not. Uh, another large category uh, of uh, lesions that can be seen here and oftentimes is uh, mistaken for others is the uh, mesonephric or Wolfian duct cysts uh, that can be remnants of the uh, you know, male uh, genital uh, formative elements that are present uh, in the embryologic state. And then finally, there's a group of, uh, of lesions that may be acquired uh, due to inflammatory changes such as hydro or hemosalpinx uh, that relate to the tube becoming dilated and forming a cystic lesion. Uh, sometimes we have adhesions due to mesothelial uh, issues or uh, inflammatory lesions between the tube and the ovary that result in uh, a sort of a cystic change. Uh, we also can get endometriotic cysts involving this, uh, this area. Uh, and then in addition, there are a few uh, neoplastic, uh, so-called serous uh, cysts uh, usually. Uh, that can uh, evolve outside of the ovary involving the tube or the paratubal tissues. Uh, and so these would be sort of true neoplastic cysts, uh, though again, mostly always uh, benign. So I thought I'd just show you a few uh, histologic slides, but to do that, let's just remember that these two uh, paramesonephric and mesonephric uh, uh, systems uh, uh, that form the Mullerian duct, and then uh, in contrast, the uh, uh, mesonephric or Wolfian duct, uh, these have a, uh, a parallel uh, pattern of di differentiation uh, that lead to the formation of the testis or the ovary, depending upon the hormonal milieu uh, that the uh, infant uh, or embryo is exposed to in utero. Uh, and that leads to differential expression and formation of the final adult uh, genitalia and reproductive organs. Uh, so this is not intended to be an embryologic uh, lecture, but just to remind us that uh, these two systems uh, develop in utero in parallel, and then depending on the uh, hormonal situation, evolve one direction or another. So here's a, a nice example of a uh, uh, fallopian tube. We see here sort of the dilated fimbria or sort of edematous fimbria, uh, the tube, uh, with an associated paratubal uh, hemorrhage, either surgical or otherwise. And right here, we can see there's a couple or three uh, nice cystic lesions. Uh, and even at this magnification, we can perceive that these are very thin-walled cysts. They're separate from the tube. Uh, so these are truly paratubal cysts. 
Um, and as we look at these uh, lesions, uh, we can see that there is virtually no uh, associated uh, connective tissue, that these are just um, epithelial line cysts. Um, and uh, we might wonder if these are, uh, you know, just a single layer or if they're a little bit attenuated. Um, uh, these could be um, sort of uh, Walthard related cysts. Uh, we do have what looks like here a little bit of uh, Walthard type epithelium uh, with a sort of a transitional type of appearance. Uh, or alternatively, these could be uh, Mullerian related cysts. If they're a single layer, we were to find some areas of cilia, such as we might suggest are present here, uh, we might just regard this as a, a Mullerian derived cyst. Now, uh, in most cases, uh, I don't think we make that distinction with any particular uh, degree of reliability, uh, but uh, it's nice to understand that those are the kind of genesis of these sorts of lesions uh, that we might see histologically. Now, looking at uh, this lesion, in contrast, here again, we see that we have the tube here, and then we have this uh, separate uh, cystic structure, uh, which has uh, some degree of size, uh, probably a centimeter in diameter and maybe six or eight millimeters in length. Um, but in contrast to the one that we just looked at, here you can see that this lesion has uh, quite a thick wall. Um, and this wall, is uh, relatively fibrotic, uh, and the lining epithelium here is clearly a serous type epithelium. We can see there are peg cells, there are ciliated cells, a nice columnar epithelium. So this is a serous type of cyst. Now, uh, this might be seen in a uh, simple Mullerian cyst, a uh, paratubal cyst that was uh, derived in this fashion. The uh, pinkish uh, contents is not particularly uh, remarkable, but what makes this distinct from um, just a simple Mullerian paratubal cyst is what's going on here. Uh, and here we see a distinctive stroma and we see some degree of prol proliferation. Uh, so this uh, cyst has a slight degree of papillarity to it, you can see here. Um, and a distinctive stroma. And in fact, even without this papillarity, we can look at these other areas of the cyst um, and detect that the stroma is, uh, again, a distinctive stroma. It's a fibrotic stroma. It's not the usual loose uh, paratubal tissue. It also is not a muscular stroma, uh, which will be distinct uh, from some of the other lesions that we might see such as like here, we have a little uh, Wolfian duct remnant with a little bit of investiture of smooth muscle around this uh, lesion. But this uh, cystic structure, pure collagenous fibrous tissue. And so this fits into the category of actually a Mullerian neoplasm, a uh, papillary cystadenofibroma, if you will, uh, of the paratubal tissues. Uh, here again on this uh, section, I think you can see, again, a distinctive stroma, uh, and that distinguishes this from the other kinds of uh, lesions that might be seen here. So uh, going on to uh, consider this here, um, Wolfian duct uh, remnants, of course, uh, is another source of these cystic lesions. Um, there are three locations where we can see this, and these are generally come, call, come under three different terms, even though they're derived from the same embryologic structures. So in the broad ligament, we call them the Wolfian duct cysts. In the paracervical tissue, they are usually called mesonephric remnants, whereas down further in the vagina, we call them these them Gartner's duct cysts. But these are all uh, simply derived from this uh, <clears throat> um, uh, Wolfian duct or mesonephric remnant, mesonephric duct uh, that uh, is more prominently developed in the male, uh, but may have uh, vestigial structures remaining in the female. Now, there may or may not be a relationship to the mesonephric and mesonephric light carcinomas that can similarly um, uh, occur in these locations. Uh, and uh, we'll reference a couple of those in the, uh, in the links 
here, but uh, the, the purpose of this is not to talk about the neoplastic component. So uh, here's a nice example. This actually is uh, from uh, a uh, prostatectomy specimen, but it illustrates uh, what these kind of uh, remnants can look like. Typically, these are small clustered glands like this um, with a single cuboidal cell lining. And they often will have this sort of uh, pink secretion uh, in the uh, tissues. So seeing something like this in a paracervical tissue, one would generally readily recognize as a uh, uh, mesonephric uh, remnants in the paracervical tissues, usually at three o'clock, nine o'clock on that lateral uh, aspect. Um, looking a little further, uh, here's one in the broad ligament uh, or adjacent to the tube. And so here we see normal tube, and here we see this cystic structure here. Now, compared to our previous paratubal tissue, this does have a little bit of a, a thickness to the, to the lining, but as we, or excuse me, to the wall. But as we look at this lesion, as we look at the wall here, I think you'll, you'll believe me that there's a, a degree of smooth muscle uh, in this tissue. Uh, this is not just uh, bland fibrous tissue. Now, additionally, these, uh, as they become cystic, these tend to have an undulating surface. They tend to have a little bit of tufting, uh, somewhat akin to the fallopian tube. And so sometimes they are mistaken for a hydrosalpinx, uh, but it does tend to have a more uh, uh, sort of undulating, ragged uh, surface. And, and here again, I think you can see lots of smooth muscle here in the wall. Uh, so. In the situation where you've got the tube adjacent and then this cystic structure, uh, it's quite easy to make the diagnosis of Wolfian duct cyst. Here we see Wolfian duct remnants without cystic dilatation. Uh, and so uh, it's likely that this Wolfian duct remnant, some of them are isolated from the others. Uh, and this one in particular became more cystically dilated, uh, giving us this uh, uh, appearance. Now we see also here we have a little serosal hyalinized nodule. Again, a little ditzel, not something we're going to be too co focused on. So uh, finally, just to touch on Walthard rest, these are urothelia-like cell clusters that uh, occur on, uh, along the uh, adnexa, primarily the fallopian tube. Uh, some think that these may be the origin of Brenner tumors um, and may become cystic, such as our first slide that we looked at. But these are rarely large enough for clinical concern. Um, and in fact, uh, their urologic or transitional neoplasia or neoplastic origin or origin is really uh, a question by the fact that our uroplakin uh, marker, which is usually a pretty good marker of uh, urothelial differentiation, uh, is not demonstrated uh, with any consistency. Uh, most of the time, you may look at a slide like this and just not even see them. Uh, if you didn't know where to look or where to find this, uh, you might uh, miss it. But here, in fact, uh, you can see we have a little cluster of stratified epithelium, sort of a, a umbrella cell type of surface here, strat flattening out along the surface. And so this is a little, uh, little Walthard rest. It's not cystic in this particular case. Um, so that uh, briefly runs us through the uh, various types of paratubal cystic structures that you can most, most frequently encounter. Uh, Mullerian, Wolfian, um, Walthard type epithelial origins and uh, embryologic origins, uh, but all probably safely grouped into the diagnostic category of paratubal cyst. Well, thank you for joining for me for this. I hope that's a little bit helpful in understanding what you're seeing through the microscope. Uh, it's not uh, rocket science or dramatic diagnostic gems. Uh, but it is helpful to understand and be able to review and see the criteria that I use in differentiating these uh, when they need to be differentiated. Certainly gives you something to talk about over the microscope as you're uh, talking to trainees and as you're uh, looking at what you see to understand what it's, it is there and why it's there. So until next time, thanks so much for joining me.